And let's begin with a brief introduction for Coach Garcia is back with us. He's a graduate of St. Francis High up in Mountain View, up in NorCal. He was all WCL honors as an offensive guard and a shot putter in track and field. And he came south to Cal State Northridge. There he earned his bachelor's and master's degree in kinesiology. And twice he was the Big Sky champion in the shot put. He now teaches PE, coaches the throws events, and is the strength and conditioning coach at Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks. Uh, Garcia has achieved the IAAF Level 5 and USATF Level 3 certification in throws. Those are the highest certifications available in the track and field world. So the man knows his stuff. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Coach Nick Garcia. Nick. All right, guys. Nice uh, to have you guys listening to me today. Uh, like Mr. O'Rourke said, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, and we'll do our best to answer them uh, with full detail at the very end. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. All right. So first, I'd like to thank everybody who's kind of been a big influence on my track and field uh, life. And uh, first one on the top left is Glenn McAtee. He gave me an opportunity at Northridge, and uh, I believed 100% in what he taught me and what we did, and it turned out to be extremely successful. And throughout the years, each of these individuals have played a huge role in my uh, technique um, system, I guess you want to say, or my technique progressions. Uh, Vern Gambetta, mostly in strength and conditioning. Uh, but everybody else, John Godina, John Smith, uh, Art Venegas, Joe Kovacs, those guys have all been real close uh, with, and they taught me a, a ton. And uh, finally, Martin Bigneser, who's in the middle uh, with a Puma jacket on. We, him and I have a podcast called Hammer Media, HMMR Media. And it's uh, we have some heavy hitters on there. It's not just the throws. Uh, it's the sprints. It's the jumps, et cetera. We've had Dan Path on, Derek Evely, a number of different guys. Uh, we just had PJ Vazell on. Uh, so, uh, we have a well-rounded, uh, subject matter in that podcast. So check it out. It's free. If you guys want to, uh, listen to it. So moving on here. Uh, for some reason I'm frozen, Mr. O'Rourke. Okay, here we go. Uh, grip and placement of the shot. Okay. I like to say it's top of the palm, bottom of the fingers. We're not holding it in our palm. We're kind of holding it right above our calluses. And what you'll see here is we have her hold it uh, to her side and the shot is top of palm, bottom of fingers, as you can see there. And she's just going to place it in her neck and put her elbow up. And that's basically how we teach the uh, go. Oops. Go. There you go. That's how we teach to start. Okay. So as soon as we get there, we're teaching them how to hold the shot, teach them how to grip the shot and go. This is what we're doing here. Okay, very, very basic. Now, as they move along in their shop and journey, um, I allow them to move it around a little bit. For example, if you start off as a glider, you may hold it a little lower underneath the jaw and the chin area, spinner, maybe farther back underneath the ear, a little farther back than that possibly. It's all their own comfort level, but to give them a good baseline, this is how we start. All right, so uh, some of the stuff that we're, uh, we're going to go over, I talked about in the rotational shot put. Uh, the very front of the ring is very much the same, and that's why you're going to see some of the same stuff, which is good because you guys will get a little more review on what we did last time. So the first one, okay, is just a release draw off two knees. Uh, you're going to see on the bottom there it says thumb down, check time. So as he finishes the throw, you're going to see him flick his wrist uh, his fingers out and look at kind of his wrist kind of looks like he's checking his time. And I'll try and pause it at the right spot. Okay. There it goes right there. One more time. We'll try and pause it here. Let's see if we can go back. There it is right there. Okay. It's extremely important that you have that little finger flick on the way out and it flicks out outside of, of your elbow, basically. Uh, that if you do that correctly, you will gain two to three feet uh on the throw if you throw it off your palm it can take off you know upwards of, of two to three to four feet so it's extremely important that the athletes get comfortable releasing off their fingers uh, a lot of them are afraid to because they feel it's going to hurt and sometimes it does uh, it's just a shot putter's life sometimes you get your you get it too high on the fingers and it flicks your fingers all the way back and it hurts for a little bit uh but um it's important that they learn that this is that this is important because if not they won't get the optimum throw All right, next 
drills here we have. Okay, on the, on the left here is what we call the two shot put drill. And it's important for uh, the shot putters to make sure that they don't cross their body when they deliver the shot put. So you'll see here on the left, she has a shot put in her right hand and a shot put in her left hand. And when she goes to deliver the shot, the goal is to not have the shot puts cross each other, okay? And uh, if they cross each other, that's their cue that they did it incorrectly. If they don't cross each other, then they did it successfully. Okay? Good. So once again, the goal here is not to have the shots cross. When you get a beginner thrower, they think Good. they have to throw across their body, and uh, you'll see them right away. They'll start crossing when you start doing this drill, and then they get it figured out really quick that they, they're not supposed to do that. Top right, we're just going one knee, okay, with the release. Nice job. Okay, getting comfortable releasing. Um, you're going to see nice a job. lot of – I do a lot of release drills, and the reason why is I feel it's very undercoached. Uh, like I said, that finger flick can have two, three, four feet to your throw if you do it right. Um, and there's too many throwers that don't do it right, and uh, they lose they lose feet. So, or meters for those of you listening uh, in Europe. So um, we make sure we work on these every day. This is part of our warm up. So they'll do their normal warm up. They'll start doing release drills, and then they'll move to their their throwing progressions for the day. On the bottom right here, uh, this is uh, Jordan Palmer. He threw 58 feet for me. And uh, he's just working on getting the finger flick and striking the shot extremely hard. We're not necessarily working so much on mechanics here. We're learning how to strike the shot with a large or a high velocity. So it's a three-step uh, crossover step, kind of like a jab delivery, jab delivery. And we do these continuously, you know, three to five reps of practice just to get, up, get warmed up and make them understand that – Velocity release is one of the most important factors of throwing a shot. All right, this next drill, uh, you're going to see a lot of rotation here. And, however, what I have found in the past number of years is athletes seem to have uh, weak, weak ankles, weak uh, calf area, et cetera. So when they go to the center of the ring, whether they're gliding into their power position or doing a full spin into their power position, that they tend to collapse on their heel. And you're not supposed to do that. you got to stay on the balls of your feet. And so the reason why I believe that is, is happening is because athletes don't ride bikes anymore or kids don't go outside and play ride bikes as often as we used to when we were kids. Therefore, their ankles are very weak from not pedaling um, and doing other things that we used to do outside, whether it's jumping off trees or walls or whatever, which just doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, so I learned these from Dan Lang, and we go – complete straight away on the track uh, as they develop their endurance for this, it starts to burn, but it's extremely important for them to understand that they have to turn their feet and stay on the balls of the feet. So we just go step, turn, step, turn. I usually lead the first couple of days. So they understand which way to turn, especially if they're beginners. So this is uh Quentin Lyons performing this, this uh, drill right here. He's a 62 foot shot putter for me. And, Clint, and for, the, for Lions, this is challenging because he's, he's flat-footed. So um, it's important for him to be very strong in this particular motion. Okay. All right, so here's my top glide list. This is not including the spinners. These are, are all the gliders. Uh, on, on the pitcher is Colin Wilmore, and he holds the glide record at, at my school. He's throwing 62, 11, and three quarters. And he's a left-hander, so it was kind of weird coaching him because uh, I'm used to right-handers, obviously. It just doesn't look – it just looks different uh, when they throw. And you'll see, uh, you know, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys over 55 feet uh, with the glide. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Six guys, excuse me, six guys. Um, and we have the same amount of number of guys uh, over 55 feet with a spin as well. Uh, so I utilize both techniques. Um, right now, uh, my best shot putter will be a rotational shot putter. Uh, my best girls, as you'll see here in a second. This is Ganika. Oh, this is Nia Britt on the right. She threw 49 feet even for me, uh, which is 15 meters roughly. And Ganika threw 49.5 for me. Um, which uh, is 15 meters and change, like 15, 15 or so. Um, 
42-2, it was by Alexa Berg. If you guys don't, if you guys are part of the city section, she is the vice president of the city section or vice commissioner. She's a vice commissioner of the city section and so on. So um, those are examples of my athletes that have used the glide. We've had some good success with both the spin and the glide. And, and I, like I said, I utilize both. I don't pigeonhole somebody just rotation or just glide. We see what works best for them. And then we move towards that technique. One thing I talked about in the rotational uh, seminar, or rotational clinic, is that as a coach, you kind of develop different characteristics and you can look at athletes and see, okay, uh, so-and-so coaches him. Uh, for example, a right leg sweep out of the back is usually particular to specific coaches. And my athletes tend to look like Art Venegas' athletes out of the back because that's I, I really understand what he's trying to do with, his, with the uh, sweep out of the back. And uh, I really believe in it. So my athletes tend to look like that. And so when they see that, you can see, okay, well, he's a Garcia coach athlete because that's what he's doing. So my gliders usually tend to look the same as well. On the top left here is uh, Kyle Solka. He threw 56 feet for me. A very explosive athlete. And you'll see very similar characteristics of how they start uh, as we go. And I'll explain that as we go as well. On the right is Ganika, what you do? Pretty nine foot throw right here. There we go. There it is. Bottom left. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Kylan's 62 11 foot throw right here. Bottom right. There we go. There it is. And I believe this is Nia Britt here, 49 foot throw. There you go. Ooh, there you go. Okay, so with the exception of Nia, Nia had a knee uh, problem. Uh, her junior playing basketball, her junior year, sophomore and junior year. Uh, so she didn't, she was uncomfortable reversing. Uh, now she's doing it at the University of Iowa, but she wasn't then. And that's the only difference you'll see between all their glides. They were all coached very similar. All right, so this is some of the stuff we went over in the rotation. And this is how I teach the beginning. Uh, we start with double extension, all right? And so understanding that this is working on the lift of lifting aspect of the throw at the finish. So understand that the first thing I teach is how to lift. Go. Okay, that's double extension. Down. Go. Down. Then we repeat it with a med ball with no release. Down. Go. Down. And finally, with the release. Now, one thing he could do a little better here, that one he did better, is what we'll do to work on the ankle strength again is we'll hold that extension on top of the ankles until um, go. the ball hits the ground. So we'll go back down. That's what you guys down. Go. Go. Down. down. All right, now we're in sync here. So go ahead and watch that. You'll see the first one, he doesn't do a great job of it, but the second job he does. Okay, he just loses his balance a little bit because he's going to get hit. Now he's going to hold it. There. Okay. So hold that extension a little bit so they get comfortable being on the balls of their feet and climbing. All right, double extension with rotation. So keep in mind the first thing I taught the athlete was to lift. So their goal here, they're going to rotate here, but they have to understand that they have to lift before they rotate. Um, some individuals teach rotate first or, or whatnot, but in my belief and in my system that's been successful for us, we lift and then rotate. My view is if you rotate first, you're not going to be able to get as a uh, dynamic as a, of a lift or as effective as a lift uh, at the finish. So we lift and then rotate. So notice he'll, on this first video, you'll see him really stress the lift first. Go. Okay. And once again, he's up on the balls of the feet. The next video here, you're going to see the med ball. Now, the goal of the med ball is to go up first and then to rotate. We don't want to see that med ball rotate. We call it the chest sweep. We don't want to see that med ball rotate first. We want to see the med ball lift and then rotate. Ready? Go. Now, you may ask yourself, well, we don't release the shot put that way. Why is this drill effective? Well, what we're trying to do here is work on the leg action. Oftentimes... Um, I would say the majority of the time, kids are very upper body do uh, dominated. So they like they think the event is all about the upper body, which in essence, it's very little about the upper body. 
So as long as we get the legs correct in the, the proper sequence, the upper body will take care of itself because they're going to want to throw straight out anyways because they want they feel that's the way it'll go the farthest in their mind. Okay, so that's why we're doing this drill. And finally, we release it. Go. Now the cue you're looking for here is if the ball goes too far out in front of them, let's say it reaches the blue part right here. So we're all, he's standing on the gray part. If it reaches the blue part, that's a little too far out. And that means that he really kind of probably rotated first before he lifted and drifted over to his left side. And we really want to stay back on our right side if you're a right-handed thrower, left side if you're a left-handed thrower. Okay, so he's done a, he's doing a great job. Right All right, finally, we're going to go ahead and go uh, with the throw horizontally now. So now we're working into how the implement will actually be thrown. Okay. Nope. I actually put that discus one in there. Sorry about that. All right, so now we would move towards from that is I call this square throws. And this is mostly for the beginner type progressions. And the reason why I do square throws, they're not in the heel toe position yet. We'll get to what a heel toe position is in a second, because I want them to follow the correct path all the way through and understand the, the path of the shot put. So right now there's a square position and they're just going to deliver from this area right here, just like we did with the med ball. Okay. Double extension with rotation. Okay. Oops. One more time. All right, now how do we set up our power position? Okay, it's the same for both the shot and the disc. This is the clearest video I had. That's why she's holding the discus. But how we do it is we have both our feet together. Just to teach them to start with, they can do it however they want after they understand what it means to be in a power position. Feet together, step out, drop it. Okay, so when she steps out right there, she has to step straight out with her left foot. If she steps too far to the left, or too far to the right, it's not going to work. They just have to step straight out. Okay. Now, once they're stepped straight out, they're going to turn their feet towards me like she just did. And at, they stepped out correctly. Their left toe should be even with their right heel. Okay. Left toe, even with the right heel. After that, I tell them knee over toe, chin over knee. And that's your power position. Knee over toe, chin over knee. Okay. And there you go. Same for the shot and for the disc. As your athlete gets a little bit more advanced, you may change some little idiosyncrasies between a shot put and the discus, but beginners, they're primarily taught the same way. All right, now we're going to go to power position progression. Okay, and before we move on, I want to explain that we in California, at least, if, you, if you're all from California, some aren't, uh, we can start training right away in September if we want to start in September. They can start training in December if they want to start training in December. In Montana, different places, it's different. Um, but when we do start training, whether it's in December or whether it's in January, we do a month of these drills just to make sure our movement patterns are developed correctly, number one. Um, and number two, we're touching all the little details that are important for the throw. Um, so now we're going to move on to the same progressions as we did for the square throws or the double extension with rotation. Now we're moving into uh, the power position progression. So first, Quinton here is going to do it without uh, a med ball. Up. Back. Up. Okay, I want you to notice here, here's another cue you can use, is I tell my athletes that when they're down in the power position. Up. Let me get this set for you. Up. Okay. Above their head is a hole in the ceiling, okay? And only their head will fit through their, that ceiling, okay? Their, their shape of their hair, their shape of their nose, et cetera, okay? If he moves his head forward at all, he's going to put his head through the actual panel of the ceiling rather than the hole that's in his uh, shape of his head. So you're going to notice him go straight up and stay over his right leg here. See that? His head stayed in the same spot. We don't want to drift okay. our head at all, okay? Uh, another cue we use is stretch your stomach. So you can see he's kind of, this is called the reverse C. He's stretching his stomach here. Okay. Staying back on the right leg. Back. 
Now, once again, we're going to the med ball. Up. You'll see him lift the med ball first, then rotate. Once again, making Up. sure that we don't sweep that med ball with the chest. Up. And then finally, he's going to throw the med ball vertically. And when he throws the med ball vertically from the power position, what you're going to see here, okay, is it's going to go straight up. And like I said, if it goes too far forward, that means that it is incorrect. Go. Okay, so it landed right on the blue. And it, from the Go. position in his ring, that's perfect. Okay. Now he's throwing the ball vertically like we did with the square throw. I prefer a little more detail orientation here of him holding the position. Like I would like him to hold that there without falling off balance. Okay. Now, this is what we move to next. I call these block glides. Some people call them Eastern Germ German technique uh, drills, things like that. All right, so we'll go ahead and play this video here. Pull. So what we're working on here is working on the transition from uh, the A position in the glide to pulling your right foot underneath you. Pull. So in practice, the, 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 the progression would be stand throws followed by what I call these are called block glides. Pull. A great cue here is, is that when she pulls her leg and it lands, she's got to keep her body back, the shot back. If she was to drop the shot put right now, she'd drop right behind her heel, right behind her foot. If she moves her upper body too much, she can drop it in front of her foot or on her toe, then that would be incorrect. Then once again, we move into the with the med balls. Go. Good. Okay, with the double extension. Go. With rotation. Good. Go. With release. Go. Go. With re release horizontally. So uh, this is a perfect example of an athlete who was a glider to start with. She was more comfortable with that when she came into my high school. We switched her to the rotation. And the reason why we did is because she's only about five foot two, five foot three. Um, normally, gliders are a bit taller, um, really powerful. So I thought for her, it'd be more awesome for her to be a rotational thrower after um, her first year gliding. Uh, she ended up throwing uh, 36 feet and change for me, which is, I think is really, really good for a, an athlete who's five foot two, five foot three. All right, and finally, this is the shot. Go. Okay, so you can see she does a really good job of staying Go. back. Keeping the shot back. All right, one more time. Oops. Go. And you'll see her too. Go. You can see how much we worked on it at the very end. Let's see if I can get it right here coming off her fingers, and you see that little flick at the very end, okay? Okay, so we go from there to starting out of the back. So just like the rotation, for those of you who were in the rotational seminar uh, last week, uh, we do from the front to the middle, and then we go from back to the middle. So I talked a little about how my gliders look very much the same. I teach them a rhythm out of the back that I learned from Tony Clario. Uh, was a coach back in New Jersey, uh, old school coach back in the day. Uh, he's got some great stuff. He's got a really good book uh, that may be out of print now, but sometimes you can find it on Amazon. It's called The Teaching Progressions of the Shot Put Javelin, Discus and Javelin. Um, it's a green book. So if you could find that, that'd be a really, really good resource for you. Uh, but anyway, here is it. I'll, I'll let it play first and I'll go over what we're trying to do. Up, down. Check. T. Bring it back. Okay, so lots of times athletes, especially newer athletes, beginning athletes, it's tough to be in the ring by yourself. Everybody, all eyes are on you. It's way different than a team sport. 
you know and they know if you didn't have a great uh, performance. Uh, rather than in the team, you don't always necessarily know who messed up and whatnot. So this becomes challenging for the athletes sometimes. They get real nervous. So I teach them the sequence because I feel that it's their checkpoints throughout the technique, and that's what they're thinking about. Okay, they're thinking about, okay, up, down, check, T. They're thinking about rhythm rather than their performance. They do the rhythm right, most likely the throw is going to be right. So we'll go back over it. Up, down, check. So the check position here is to make sure that this left knee is not past this right knee. Uh, I have a current thrower right now, one of the best freshmen in the country last year. And when I got her, she would pull her knee all the way past her right knee. And what happens is when she would do that, it would pop her upper body up for balance and she would glide across the ring straight up. And it would take a lot of feet off her throw, a lot of meters off her throw. So we got that fixed for her now. And so that's the check. Make sure that left knee is behind that right knee or even as close to even, but never past it. Okay. T. So here's your T. Okay. This is for rhythm again. Some people choose to do the T. Some people don't. And bring it back. Bring it back. And then you check again to make sure that left knee doesn't pass the right knee. So when I teach everybody the glide start, this is how we do it. We'll watch it one more time. Up. Down. Check. T. Bring it back. And there you go. As they become a better thrower, they can move through that faster. Okay. It doesn't have to be that slow in that segment and they can go at their own rhythm. All right, then we move to a fall A. So if you notice, last time, we, the last thing we did in the front of the ring was the block glide. This is called fall A, and we're going to lead into that block glide. Up, down, check, T, bring it back, fall A. So now we're in the, that position of what I call the block drill, okay? And so now we pretty much have the throw three quarters of the way done pretty quickly. Okay. When they do this, okay, when they do the fall A, let me see if I can get to that position quickly. T, bring it back, fall A. Okay, you want the shoelaces looking down towards the ground, and you want this left leg firing right to the board. Okay, you don't want it firing up. You want to fire it straight down towards the board at that, that angle right there. Now, some of the limiting factors in gliders is you'll notice uh, my best guy, Kylan Wilborn, had a natural, really good, uh, his leg, it would have been his right leg since he was a left-handed thrower. He just fired it. Some athletes you have to really work on understanding what it means to fire it. Some have a very sloppy left leg, a very slow left leg. So you got to work on it. Uh, Asante's here was actually pretty good as a natural. So make sure they're aggressive with it. They fire it rather than Pushing off the right, you fire with the left and push off the right. Last key detail here is I teach my athletes to go off the heel. All right, 90% uh, of the gliders do go off the heel. You can go off the toe, but it's very rare. Um, most of the best gliders or technical models you'll see, most of them come off their heel. Um, so we teach pulling off the heel or pushing off the heel, excuse me. All right, so now that's basically the – whole thing okay of, as far as the glide goes um and then we're going to move into a little more advanced things here as you go along so we use a hurdle to help us balance and obviously go get more aggressive leg. they have the hurdle to hold on to it for for balance so and go we'll go through the whole sequence up down t bring it back check fall a okay one more time. Go. Okay. You'll see. I talked a little bit about here. Let me go back. And go. Her left knee is a little bit past her right knee there. Okay. You saw her do it right now. She's doing it incorrectly. Uh, we can't have that. So I would, I would make sure we fix that uh, next time we had practice. Okay. Nonetheless, though, good job falling A. All right, out of the back. Down. Check. T. 
Bring it back. Fall A. Pull. So there we're putting together our whole drill now. Okay, we will put together the fall A with the block. Okay, the block drill. Down. Check. T. Bring it back. Fall A. Pull. She does a really good job of not bringing her upper body up when she goes to pull. Good balance up on the balls of the feet. Okay, so this is a good job by, by Asante here. Down. T. Bring it back. Fall A. Pull. Go. Very good. And now you see how all the sequencing, all the drilling with all the different drills and the med balls, how they all come together. Down. T. T. Bring it back. Fall A. Pull and go. Nice job. All right, so now we need to move to actual the real glide. And athletes need to understand how to cover ground. So the first thing we start to do is we snap A off a curb or off a step. Currently, we're doing it off a step because we don't have this throwing area anymore. We have a different throwing area. So we'll do it off a curb, okay, where they're going to snap their left leg to the board or, or across out of the back like they're falling A. And they're going to land in their power position. And what the curb does is it allows them to cover a little bit of ground, under, making them understand they need to cover ground. Down. Check. T. Bring it back. Snap A. Okay, I want you to notice one thing I need Down. to fix here. Check. T. Bring it back. Snap A. When she lands, okay, it's coming off a higher spot, so she kind of lands on, on her heel. So I'm going to give her a little break on that one. But her right foot should be turned this way, okay? It should be turned at a 90-degree angle, I guess you'd want to say. Um, so she would need to fix that. I would correct that next time we did it. Um, but nonetheless, you have the idea of understanding to fall off the curb and cover a little bit of distance. From there, we're going to set our, our – uh, feet seven feet away from the curb those of you who don't know that the shot put ring is seven feet uh in diameter so we're gonna be seven feet away from the curb and our goal here is to be able to snap our left foot to the curb okay it's a good way to go ahead and teach the glide teach the drill and understand help them understand that they have to cover ground okay and then down distance of the check day, how much they need to cover t Bring it back. Snap. Okay, so she did a really nice job there. Down. Check. T. Bring it back. Snap. Okay. Now we go from that. Now we go to actually doing it in the ring. Down. Check. T. And go. Down, check, T, and go. All right, so I apologize for the misspelling on my reverse progression here. I had a few questions last rotational uh, from Coach at uh, Hard Now, I believe, about going over the re uh, reverse progression again. So this is how I teach the reverse progression in the shot. Um, for beginners, there's a few little details I add as they get better and better at doing it. Uh, one important thing is that they have to keep their feet on the ground and, and rotate them as soon as they learn that they need to switch their feet. Um, but at first, I just kind of teach them to, to rotate and jump so they get the feeling of how it should feel when they do the reverse correctly. So what you should do is find a uh, X. So this is we're using this X right here, or this where these two lines intersect perpendicular and horizontally, I guess you want to say. Um, and, uh, he's left heels on that. And then his right foot's always in the back. He's going to jump off two feet first Out. go, and land on two feet and put his right foot exactly where his left foot was. Okay. Out. go. 
Out. Go. Then, okay, we're going to land on one foot. Now, believe it or not, okay, it's going to be a lot harder for them to make it to that position. Now, you saw when he was landing on two feet, he was able to get his right foot to where his left foot was, no problem. Okay, here he's going to be a little short. Not a lot because he's a really good thrower, but you'll see people won't even come close. And that's why we have that X as a spot. So every time they do it, they can check and see to make sure that they made it there. Go. He didn't cover the whole line like he did last time. But now he's just landing on one foot. Go. Okay, putting his right foot right where his left foot was. Now I teach to land heel down. And uh, the reason why heel down in the shot put is because of the toe board. And depending what a type of official you get, if they scrape their heel when they're rotating to stay in, if they have to rotate to stay in on top of the board, uh, not well on top is a foul for sure. But if they kind of, there's a question mark kind of, was it inside corner of the toe board? Some may call it some not. So we don't want to leave anything to chance. So if they have to rotate out of it, they're going to spin on their heel and try and stay in rather than spin on their toe. Because if they spin on their toe, they'll raise their heel and they'll scrape the toe board possibly. Um, so that's why you'll see him landing on his heel. So we go from that to square position throw, throwing motion uh, with the reverse. Go. Okay. One more time. Down. Go. So look over here on the left. Yep. He is a freshman. He's a senior now, and he's a good thrower now. This is a, he was just learning. You're going to see his right foot not even come close to where his left foot was. Okay, it's, it's semi close, but not One more time. exactly where it needs to be. Down. Go. Yeah, on that. Go. Okay, bottom here. Go. Now we're going to our power position. Okay, we go to our power position. We're on the square throw, I call it. And now they do the same thing with the throwing motion, switching their feet. Get there. One more time. Down. Go. That's better. Okay. Now you may ask yourself, like, why is the reverse important? Uh, a little story of mine is when I was a young thrower, um, I was going to these all current meets in Los Gatos, which are historic all current meets where a bunch of big time throwers have thrown. And I was a senior in high school and I didn't have a coach. I was just graduated, but I liked throwing. And I was like, I, I still want to throw. Maybe I'll, you know, try it in junior college, whatnot. And I threw and I got done. And this older individual came up to me and he said, uh, do you know how to reverse? And I'm like, I don't know what that is. And he goes, well, if you learn how to reverse, you'll add seven feet to your throw. I said, really? I go, how do you do it? And he just kind of showed me real quick. This is what you want to do. Just switch your feet. So my dad and I went out every single day and probably took 50 throws trying to figure it out. That following week, I came back to the same meet and I threw seven feet further, seven foot PR. Um, so I believe my PR at the time was 45 something. I threw 52 something. Um, 40, 45, 11, I threw 52, seven, I think something somewhere around there. Um, and the weird part about it is that individual changed my life. And I never saw him one time. I went to those all current meets for the next 13, 14, 15 years. Never saw him again. And he changed my life because he made me a good thrower. Um, and I wish I didn't know who he was because I owe him a ton uh, to where I'm at today. Okay. We finally go with a med ball. Go. Okay. You see it's a harder for him to get there. I need him to get go. to that line. Okay. Good. One more time. Go. Get to the line. He doesn't quite get it there, so we can do it again until he gets Good. it there. And finally, you'll see him on the top right here. Do it with the shot. Go. Land on his heel and hold. Go. Now, so I want to use this as an example Go. of just what you coach. Okay, you'll see him stick to finish for the most Go. part. Get a little late at the end. All right, if we go back to the beginning of the presentation and we look at Kyle Solka, you'll see him stick his finish like I coach it. There it is right there. OK, 
There he is right here. So it's important to have something like that. Go. Because. Ready. Go. Go. You want to make sure they have confidence in the meet that they're not going to foul. All right, to finish off here, I have a few drills that we'll use. Um, this is called the left leg lock glide. And what we're doing here is an athlete who doesn't quite understand how to use their right leg to get across the ring. We lock the left in place so they don't fire it like we talked about when we fall A or snap A. Okay, they just push off the right here. And you'll see what I mean. Check. T. Bring it back. I messed up as a coach there by saying bring it back because I forgot. Check. T. Bring it back. Oh. So you'll see how she didn't bring it back. She just left it locked out there and just used her right leg to get across the ring. And Asante's powerful, so she's able to get it Check. back without T. Use her left. Bring it back. Oh. And that's a left leg lock. And finally, if you have a problem with an athlete chasing the shot, or getting the shot, um, uh, or getting out over the toll, where I guess you want to say. Uh, we use a term called chasing the shot put. And a lot of the times, athletes think the shot put's out of their hand, and so they stop pushing on it. We call it chasing the shot. We want to continually push on the shot for as long as possible. And uh, that gives uh, probably a few more feet if you do it correctly. Uh, Mike Lewis taught me that, who was Greg Taffer Allison's coach back when I was in junior college. He was a CSM coach, called San Mateo. He goes, you got to chase the shot. And as soon as I learned that, I added a foot to my throw. Um, so this up and over helps do that. Now, you can't do this in a competition. It's a drill. But it teaches the athlete to be aggressive with the delivery. Go. Okay, so they keep chasing, keep Go. pushing the whole time. One more time. Go. All right. Thanks for your time. Uh, hopefully you guys got something out of that. Feel free to email me uh, at yahoo.com. My uh, Nick underscore G underscore Garcia at yahoo.com. Uh, I post videos on Instagram and Twitter all the time. Um, usually when there is a track season, so there'll be a track season coming up here. So I'll have some videos of us training and whatnot. And finally, like I talked about, hammermedia.com, myself and Martin Bigniser have the site. We have a podcast. We also have a uh, membership thing with all these progressions that are on there, throwing progressions. It's got articles about sprinting, articles about throwing, different systems, different programs, et cetera. Um, lots of information on there. So check that out if you're interested. Very good. Nick, if you'll stop sharing your screen, thank you very much. We've got about a dozen questions here, and that's great because we've got about 15 minutes of time. So okay. let's go through this. First off, your audio cues are outstanding. Uh, the, the way you word that, anybody who's ever coached a field event athlete, when a kid comes back, goes, you never told me that. Your audio cues are great. All right, let's go through these. First off, uh, exercises to strengthen the fingers. What do we do? Well, there's a number of different things, but starting off with those releases, that helps. If they're not comfortable starting off with the releases in the shot, uh, use med balls. Okay. You can lay on your back and have an ass or you as a, I would prefer if you're not in college to have the coach drop it to their chest area, have them catch it like with both hands and work on finger flicking it. I know coach Pendleton at Esperanza or who's that now Paso Robles. He likes to use a bucket of rice and just have their hand moving inside a, bu a bucket of rice. But I think that uh, hand problems tend to be, more for the individual athlete, like I've thrown heavy, heavy shots personally, 20-pound shots. I've never had an issue with my wrist or my fingers or my hands, and I've never done any of that type of stuff. Um, we've done – don't get me wrong. As a strength and conditioning coach, we do a lot of pull-ups and things like that, and that helps my grip strength and my hand strength. Um, but putting your hand through rice, uh, doing a lot of release drills that aren't as intense as maybe the throw – the three-step jab uh, crossover drill that I show for just aggression uh, of, of velocity in the shot put, that will work as well. 
All right, let's go over to, there were a couple of questions about med balls and you mentioned that. So let's go there. Could you give us an idea of the size and weight of med balls you use and at what drills do you use them? So the weight, I guess, when each drill changes. Uh, so what we do is we keep, it's pretty standard. And so what I do is I buy uh, the size of the shot put med ball. So for the men, we use 12 pound med balls. For the women, we use uh, 4K med balls. And if we don't have 4K available, we use an eight pound med ball. Uh, but those are the primary sizes that we use. Now we do something called specific development exercises for the more advanced athletes, maybe an athlete on a different system. And we'll do drills like that called specific development exercise with upwards of, you know, 25 pounds uh, or so, but that's more for the advanced athletes. But for the beginning athletes, the progressions you saw either four kilos, eight pounds or a 12 pound med ball. Okay. Lots of questions about the difference between the two. So let's kind of take those as a group here. So what are the specific characteristics of a spinner and a glider? Well, it's interesting you asked that. Uh, I can, I, I'm going to answer the best way I know how, because uh, last night we had a throws panel with myself, Tony Sorelli, uh, Bill Pendleton, uh, Joe Frontier from Wisconsin, and uh, Jim Akins from Chicago. And we are on this throws panel. And it's going to be on a podcast soon uh, called Throw Big Throw Far by Joe Frontier. We talk a lot about that, but I'll give you kind of a, a background of what we talked about. So the first thing I want to start off with is right away, normally I talk about Asante not being very tall. She was five foot two, five foot three. And so the glide probably wasn't necessarily going to work for her as effective as a spin if she became a good spinner. So first the thing I look at is height. Now I'm, I'm not tall. I'm five foot seven. I threw the shot 61, two and three quarters with the international shot. Um, I was lucky I had some explosiveness to me, um, but I wouldn't have done that with the glide. I almost guarantee I wouldn't. My PR with the glide in junior college was 49.9. Okay. And uh, I increased my throw by, you know, 12 feet or so, uh, 11 or 12 feet. So height is one factor that I look at. Um, as far as that goes. Now, does, it, does that mean that big, big, big guys can't spin? Absolutely not. Ryan Krauser is big. You know, he's the world record holder and he's, he rotates. Uh, Christian Cowell is a big individual. He threw 73, 10 or so. Uh, he's huge. Um, but as far as choosing what I think would be best, um, if they're smaller, then we're probably going to, or shorter, where they're probably going to spin. If they're bigger, we'll look at how well they move, how well they're coordinated. And we'll see. Now, one of the questions was, when do you decide whether they are a spinner or they have to go to glide? Well, the big thing is, is what I have, in my opinion, what I have found is that good glide shot putters get between five and eight feet conversion, eight feet on the high end if they're a really good glider, okay, from their stand throw to their full throw. Spinners get anywhere from eight feet on the low end to 15 plus on the high end. Like Tom Walsh gets a huge, huge uh, conversion. Um, I used to get personally as a spinner, uh, 12 feet roughly on a bad day, 10, on a good day, 13 or 14. So <clears throat> once they start spinning and I'm not seeing that conversion, I'm thinking, okay, well, they're not, they can't convert. Maybe they don't understand how to get the power into the shot and whatnot. And it's been some time since we've been working on it. Then I'll switch them over to the glide and right away you'll see an improvement in their conversion from their stand throw to their full throw. So those are the few things that I, I look at. Now, when athletes come in, I teach them all how to rotate first because I want them to throw both the discus and the shot put. And we killed two birds with one stone. So we line them up on the track, uh, my throwing area, 20 at a time, and we're running it like a camp. And they're all learning how to rotate and all the drills of rotating, all the movement patterns. When we start moving into throwing. If they show me that maybe they're not capable of spinning or don't have the coordination to do so, then, or they don't believe in it, then we'll move to the glide. Well, that was a question just popped up on the screen. Do you force everybody to try both? I force everybody to rotate first. And if they can't rotate first, then we move into the glide. Now, okay. one thing I like to mention is that I have everybody throw the discus. The discus and the shot, uh, rotation in the shot put is very, very similar for the most part, especially for the beginning athletes. Um, so you know, it's not so different. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. Now, the difference is, is that your arms are out wide in the discus. They're in tight in the shot. So the shot put rotation is a little bit quicker than the discus. So usually some throwers who aren't maybe successful spinning in the shot can throw the discus fairly, fairly well because it's a slower movement since they're out wider. They're all more balanced uh, since their arms are out wider, if, if that makes sense. It does. 
All right. Um, once a thrower has decided he is a glider or a spinner, should he sometimes still practice the one he used to do? No. Uh, it's live by the sword, die by the sword. One of the things we also talked about last night are the athletes you see warm up uh, with a rotation and a track meet, and then their first throw in the meet, they did do a glide. And uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You commit to something and you do it. And so my, you won't see any of my athletes do any stand throws. You won't see my athletes do any, uh, I'm sorry, any standing throws in competition. Uh, if they get nervous, it's live by the sword, die by the sword. They're going to do what they're coached to do. The only time I will allow it is if it's a, a point scoring meet and they have two fouls and they have to get a mark in and there's not more than eight competitors. I might have them do a stand throw just to move on. But after that, they won't, they'll, they'll do their spin or, or whatever they're supposed to be doing again. And even then I have to look at myself in the mirror and ask myself, do I really want to stoop down to this level and have them stand throw? And sometimes I don't, sometimes they have to learn. So um, yes, that's that we don't, we never switch. Do one and stick with it. Stoop down to that level. That's awesome. Well, that kind of leads up to this one question. What's the uh, progression of warm up for a thrower during a competition for me? So what we do is we have each, I teach them all those drills. Now leading up to a first competition, we may have an inner squad competition or whatnot. And throughout the year, what we'll do is we'll see what works best for that athlete. And so I typically start them off, okay, do a stand throw with non-reverse, a stand throw with reverse, then move on to your next thing, whether it be a block drill or for a glider or for a spinner, it may be a, a half turn throw or a, a walking type throw. Um, and some kids, uh, one of my best gliders I've had, Sam D. Martinez, was a 57 foot shot putter for me. He didn't take any full throws in warm-ups. He took two stand throws and he was done. And because he knew that his first throw every time a competition was his best throw. And so we would take, keep track of his warmups. Okay. His first full warmup was his best throw of the day. So he would take his two stand throws. He figured that out by the mid season and then bang, uh, his first throw would be his first full and he'd throw, throw really well on his first throw. So you have to de de determine that throughout the season, but a good rule of thumb is to start with a stand throw, a stand throw with reverse and then move to your fulls. Uh, from there and no more you'll see athletes getting a warm-up competition um, and they you know waste all their throws during warm-ups and uh, you don't want to do that you want to take no more than four to five throws if your third throw uh, total your first full is a big big throw then I sometimes I shut it down I say okay we're good we're done we're ready to go um, there's been so many times where I've been in competition where um, I knew watching the other athletes that okay, well, he's throwing really far in warm-ups and he keeps throwing and keeps throwing and keeps throwing and he's throwing farther than I am. And then in the meet, I knew that I had a shot to beat him because he would be a little wore out or waste them all in warm-ups and all his intensity in warm-ups. Try to keep the intensity lower in warm-ups, make it nice and crisp, make sure everything's fine right. And then when your name's called, that's when it's go time. All right, Coach Martinez just popped this one in here. What drills or cues do you give to those that are not using their non-dominant arm to help finish the throw on delivery. So the off arm. Okay, so I don't talk about the non-dominant arm a lot. And my philosophy came with this from, from John Godina. Um, if you talk too much about the non-dominant arm, in my opinion, what happens is if you're a glider out of the back, you're gonna rip that left arm out as fast as possible to deliver the throw. And if you do that, you're gonna land open um, and, and you're not going to land separated. So what we'll do with our release drills, going back to the release drills that I showed, you'll see them pull their left arm in as they do the release drills. And that kind of helps us with that Don dominant arm uh, and allows me not necessarily to talk so much about it during the full throw. Like I said, I feel that they get too dominant with it, that opposite arm, okay? And they'll want to be start pulling it out of the way and pulling it off the throw. And next thing you're going to see is, you're going to see a kid pull his left arm too far this way. The shot's going to go this way. And you're going to have two forces going opposite directions, which we don't want. So that's why I don't necessarily talk about it. I apologize if that doesn't help you, but that's why I don't talk about it. That's all right. Here's a great question related. Are gliders more likely not to foul? <laughs> well, <clears throat> if, um, if you have a solid technique, then – you're not going to foul with, with any, 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 uh, any type of rotation or glide. Um, some people may be more confident with the fact. 
of that. Now, understand the difference is that with gliders to be consistent, you don't have to put in as much time, in my opinion. Okay. Elite gliders, yes. But gliders that are 50 foot shot putters in high school level, uh, the same level of thrower with the spin, the rotational throw is going to have to a lot, be a lot more, put a lot more time in to be consistent as that glider, if that makes sense. But that rotational throw may yield bigger results. So it's a little bit of a gamble, a yin and a yang. So consistency, yes. Okay. But if that rotational thrower is putting that time in, then he could just even that out with extra time uh, of being solid technically and comfortable. Okay. Um, when is it time for an athlete or a thrower to buy throwing shoes and do they really help? Uh, the first day of practice, they should have them. And <laughs> yes, they, they do help. Um, <clears throat> there, you know, unless it's raining, some guys wear tennis shoes and stuff, but it's really important to, to understand that those things help you rotate better. What happens is they have less service area on the bottom to rotate on, unlike shoes that are completely flat. And they also, the shoes that are like tennis shoes and whatnot, they have grip on them. So it creates more friction. So it doesn't allow the athlete to spin very well on those, on your feet. So it's extremely important to have those, those throwing shoes. So they understand that, that rotating their feet, turning their feet easy is, is really important. So yes, they should have them the first day. And yes, they really do help. Uh, you just the same thing is do football, do cleats help in football. Definitely. They definitely help. Okay. If a thrower can't get all the way across the ring, should that thrower start uh, all the way at the back of the ring? Well, um, a few things you can do. I say yes, because ultimately that's what you're working towards. Um, now, if they're a beginner and they're a little more, they're not as strong as they need to be. Uh, let's say they're a freshman, they're coming in. Then you could start them. I, I usually give them one foot. So I've had them put their foot at the back of the ring where the rim's at. And they can start right behind where their heel's at right there. So about a foot. Um, but there's a bunch of drills and specific development movements you can do to develop that. And one of those is that snap A drill I showed you to the curb, where they start at seven feet from the curb and try to get their left foot to the curb. And then in order to develop strength doing that, what I have my athletes do is hold two dumbbells to their side. So let me see if I can show you here. So they'll take two dumbbells, hold them to the side like this. Okay, we'll go through a whole sequence. T, bring it back, check, and then they fire, holding the dumbbells. Um, and obviously, they're holding two 10 pound dumbbells. That's 20 more pounds than they actually need. Um, so, actually, I, if it's a female throw, it's 12 more pounds they actually need because it's, it's 20 pounds total. So that'll help them develop the strength to get across. Um, I would just keep making sure that they have a goal to get across that seven foot circle. And like I said, uh, put a mark seven feet away from a wall, from a, a bench, whatever, to make sure that they work on getting across that ring. All right, I think we have time for one more here. This is a great one here. You mentioned earlier that you want everybody to throw the shot and the disc. Does that mean practice time is 50-50 for each event? Well, what we have here, uh, what we do, and yes, I would say it's 50-50, depending on what level you are and whatnot. So uh, we'll throw a shot, let's say on Monday, discus on Tuesday. On Wednesday is usually the day before our dual meet. So we'll throw uh, both, like 10, 10 to 15 throws of both as kind of a meet and warm up uh, systems check. Thursday, we'll compete in both. Friday, depending on how they did on Thursday, and if we have an invitation on Saturday, I usually either give them the option to have it off or come back out and repeat what they did on Wednesday, uh, compete on both on Saturday and Sunday it's off. Now, um, if we start with a shot the previous Monday, then we're going to come back and start with discus this Monday. All right. Now, if I have, a, if I have pure track athletes, like I have two girls that are pure track athletes, pure, they don't do any other sports and they're very good throwers. Um, they throw both shot and disc and I have them on a specific system. They're going to throw both on the same day. Every day, the same thing over and over like Groundhog Day until they hit something called peak form. Once they hit peak form, then we change everything up and uh, they repeat, they create a new workout and they do the same thing every day once again. Um, <clears throat> so that's how we do it. Uh, the reality is we do it twice a week where we throw on the same day, both the shot and the disc. And that's what you do in a meet. So they need to be prepared for that. And finally, the way I set practice up is I have sometimes, the most I've had is 43 throwers. 
Uh, I usually have around 23 to 25. And what we have is we have two big throwing nets um, with two discus rings going into those nets, one into each one. And then we have one regular discus ring. And then it was a shot put day. We have uh, two shot rings into each net. So that's four shot rings plus the regular shot ring. And how we do it is, is we call it the law of the jungle. And whether you believe this is harsh or not harsh, uh, they're ranked by what their marks are. And the top five throwers get to throw in the main ring. The next five throwers throw in the, in the net closest to the main ring and so on all the way down to ring five. And when we do it that way, if somebody in ring five beats somebody in ring three, they get to bump up a ring and the other kid bounces down a ring. So they understand what competition is about and how it works. Um, <clears throat> so there is definitely understanding of competition. There's rewards, okay, et cetera, uh, to get move closer and closer to the main ring. So that's, that's how we do it, and that's how we split things up. That's a great way to end. It is survival of the fittest. That's great. Nick, thank you so much. Another outstanding presentation. That was great. I want to say hi. I saw Sean Pickering's on here. Sean's from, uh, from Europe, so I want to say hi. Thanks for listening, Sean. Nice, nice to see you. We'll talk to you, I'm sure. So we did our meter references. Thank you. There you go. All right, Nick, thank you so much. We hope that you'll come back at 8 o'clock for our second session tonight, uh, Olympic, two-time Olympian, Andrea Black, it's going to go through the teaching progression to show your kids how to most effectively come out of the blocks. And so uh, it, it's great. I saw Andrea's presentation on this last year at a clinic, and it was phenomenal. So we hope you'll join us at 8 o'clock tonight. If you want to, if you haven't registered, just go back to runmountsack.com slash education and register. You've got a couple minutes. We're only about 20 minutes away from that. And a reminder that we'll be back tomorrow night at 630, and we'll stay with field events tomorrow night. We'll have our first pole vault session, uh, Pole Vault 101 with Cal State Fullerton coach Estelle Nieto. And then uh, a great presentation in high jump with Doug Nordquist, Olympian, uh, three and a half things that matter in the high jump. Uh, so I hope one, going over the bars, one of the regular ones and not the half. So anyway, uh, we hope you'll join us once again. Thank you to, to Nick and thank you everybody for joining us and hopefully we'll see you at eight, eight o'clock. Good night. Mm -hmm.